Hi, I'm Paul Comfort, and welcome to another great edition of Transit Unplugged, one of the nation's premier podcasts focusing on our transit industry by talking to the leaders. And on today's edition, we speak with the leader. That's right, Nat Ford, CEO of Jacksonville Transportation Authority and this year's chairman of the American Public Transportation Association. He'll tell us about his career rising from the subways of New York to be CEO of three of the nation's top transit systems. And he'll discuss where APTA is headed this year with his five priorities. All that on this edition of Transit Unplugged. What does it mean to be a successful public transit agency? What are you doing to lead the way? It's time to learn from the top transit professionals in North America. This is Transit Unplugged with your host, Paul Comfort. I'm Paul Comfort, your host of Transit Unplugged, and today I'm excited to have with me one of the biggest names in transit in America, Nat Ford, who is uh, CEO of the Jacksonville Transportation Authority, and this year, Chairman of APTA, the American Public Transit Association, which is our national association for all the major transit systems. Nat, great to have you with us. No, great to see you, Paul. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we're, we're sitting out. You won't believe where we're at. <laughs> we're sitting out on a beautiful golf course in Palm Springs, California, where That's Nat right. and I are here attending the APTA Business Members um, annual Board meeting. Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. tell us some about Nat, your background and how you ended okay. up being a CEO. I know you've had a long career in transit and led a bunch of the systems. Yeah. So it's a really fantastic career. I mean, I just look back at it and I'm just, I'm so excited and thrilled for myself, but, uh, started out as a train conductor with the uh, New York city transit system. Uh, my father, uh, was uh, a high ranking manager at the time and eventually a high ranking executive in the uh, New York subway system and uh, at some point he suggested that I take a job with New York Transit and start uh, my work career as an adult and uh, it led to me uh, moving into a number of positions pretty rapidly. There was a lot of change that was going on in New York Transit back in the uh, 80s okay. and I was part of that, ch that change process and then eventually uh, left there and went to work for BART uh, as an assistant chief transportation officer. Uh, and uh, subsequently uh, left BART to work as a senior VP of operations for MARTA and Atlanta and got appointed in 1997, uh, no, in 2000, to become the CEO of the uh, MARTA system in Atlanta. That was just, you know, a remarkable opportunity, and I, I still, even to this day, have really fond memories of working with that board, and they're taking a chance on a very young guy <laughs> at that time uh, to become their CEO. Uh, I, after, in 2006, I uh, got recruited by the San Francisco MTA. Uh, San Francisco MTA was very unique because in addition to running one of the largest transit systems in the nation, uh, the Muni system, uh, and one of the oldest transit systems in the nation, uh, the voters there created the MTA and merged together parking and traffic. Okay. So I was responsible for all of the on-street, off-street parking, tra uh, traffic signaling, uh, uh, pedestrian signaling, countdown wow. signals, all, all, all things transportation, uh, as well as the uh, municipal parking lots, and eventually I assumed responsibility for the taxis. So uh, the voters in San Francisco elected to merge all of those transportation uh, modes under one umbrella, and it's a very unique uh, opportunity for me. I got into biking and pedestrian uh, management and, and biking uh, uh, infrastructure development. and. Uh, then, uh, you know, uh, change in leadership in terms of the mayor's office. Uh, I had been there five and a half years. It was time to move on. And uh, I was fortunate that the opportunity in Jacksonville arose with the JTA. And uh, that's where I rest now. And I'm extremely excited about what we're doing there at the JTA. Also, rather unique because we build roads and bridges. That's in our DNA. Uh, we start out as an expressway authority. We have tolling authority. So I also serve. In fact, uh, today's my last day serving as the chair of Team Florida, the ah. toll, toll and expressway authority members uh, for the state of Florida. Uh, and that uh, the expressway authority uh, was asked to take on public transportation and merge that in uh, a okay. couple of decades ago. And so now I run a road building toll wow. uh, authority that also has public transit as its responsibility. So a uh, wide range of transportation in yeah. my background. And I enjoy, you know, just in terms of being a CEO, it's 
it's really afforded me a great opportunity to meet some great people and do some good work in some of these cities. That's great. Mm -hmm. Before we get too much into what you're mm -hmm. doing right now, I want to jump back to San Francisco. I was there recently. Yeah. The, the hills in that city are amazing. Very and, challenging. And how many different transportation groups are there? They yeah. talk about that a little bit. Well, I think, you know, when you look at the Bay Area, I, I you know, it ranges somewhere between, I say, 20 and 26 different yeah. transit operators in the Bay Area and pretty large transit operators, right. I would say. You know, you have. How the, is that? Yeah. Well, I think from a municipality standpoint and a political standpoint, I think everyone wanted to have control of their own operation. Okay. Uh, they do recognize that the two centers of the Bay Area, Oakland and San Francisco, need to be tied together. That's where the BART commuter rail operation came into play. Okay. However, you have AC Transit that operates uh, into San Francisco, but really focuses on AC, uh, Alameda County right. and provides bus service in Alameda County. Uh, you have San Mateo uh, Transit. Uh, which uh, runs the Samtrans system just south of San Francisco. Okay. Again, providing bus service in San, Fran San Mateo County, but also connecting with San Francisco, uh, running routes into San Francisco. And they operate the Caltrain commuter rail system, which I had the opportunity of serving on that board when I was as, uh, as the CEO of the uh, SFMTA. You got Golden Gate Transit. You have a, a whole host of players. I don't yeah. want to leave anybody out. No, that's all right. <laughs> but it's just amazing. Yeah, right. I rode streetcars uh, along the, um, along the waterfront. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those yes. were amazing. That was something that we ha we took a lot of pride in operating. And if you oh, remember. Oh, you ran that? Yes, yes. Oh, so, wow. so the uh, streetcar operation, cable car operation, our electric trolley buses, trolley buses, uh, and uh, the, I, I'm not leaving it, I think, and then our bus operation, yeah. uh, we had probably one of the most diverse fleets in yes. San Francisco in terms of infrastructure. You had the, the, you had the cable cars, which date back almost 150 right. years yeah. in terms of that infrastructure. Then right after, uh, I guess, the Loma Prieta earthquake, Loma okay. Prieta, uh, the I can't remember the double decked highway that collapsed. There was a right. highway oh, that yeah, collapsed yeah, yeah. along the Embarcadero. Decision was made not to uh, build it back. It was right. a very it was a barrier, frankly, to San Francisco in terms of the actual bay. And the idea was to bring the streetcar operation uh, in okay. to you know open you know open up economic development along yeah. the waterfront. And it was fantastic. It's phenomenal. And those vehicles. Uh, between the cable car operation and the street cars, who the street cars, I would say, um, most cases are about fifty to sixty years yeah, old. Yeah, they're older cars that have been refurbished. Yes, and so the from all around the country, from all uh, all around the world. Oh, we that's had, right. right yeah. We had vehicles from Australia, from England. Yeah, that was uh, neat. We had vehicles from Portugal, uh, and the idea was uh, this was not just really as a tourist attraction. Uh, but you had a livery that really attracted people from around the wor world, around the country. Yeah. But it really was a backbone transit operation, too. Absolutely, and People man. used it on a daily basis. Yeah. Similar to the cable cars. It's not just tourists right. on the cable cars. Yeah, my are, kids loved mm -hmm. it. I had my two of my girls with me. We rode it every oh, day. Went to fantastic. all the sites. It was great. It was very, yeah. It's very, very well, a very popular operation. Yeah. And just if you look at San Francisco in general and what public transit means to a community or city like that, uh, the per capita utilization rivals some of the, the largest transit systems in this nation in terms of a population, at least, and give you the perspective. You have a sleeping population in San Francisco, about 750,000, and you, it swells to 1.2 uh, during the course of a day. But Muni, in an, at the time I was serving there, was carrying 750,000 people a day on its own system, wow. not counting Riders coming in from BART, coming yeah. in from Sam Trans, coming in from Golden Gate, coming from AC Transit. So very transit-rich environment. That's great. Yeah. Interesting. And one just quick tidbit on mm -hmm. your New York experience. So our buddy Andy Byford now yes. has got his hands full. Talk about yeah. that a little bit. A Andy's a great guy. I I've had a chance over the years to really get to know him, and uh, I'm really excited about him having that opportunity. Uh, you know, I, New York is you know uh, holds a special spot in my heart. Uh, and I was there during the time frame where we really turned the system around. Uh, and, you know, if you remember back years ago, you would always see those movies that had the New York transit system looking in a, you know, disrepair with graffiti right. and right. things of that nature. And I was fortunate to develop in my early years uh, that appreciation for maintenance, capital investment, uh, quality of service, customer service, and cleanliness and things of that nature. And so with those types of principles, 
uh, you, we were able to dig that system out. And mm. So when by the time I left and went to BART, Mark, um, you know, New York Transit was well on its way to be the premier system in the country. Oh, and yeah. So you remember those days. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, it's sad to see that after that major investment and effort, for it to kind of fall back, yeah. back into the uh, uh, into the you know the bad uh, quality of service that it has, uh, but I think Andy's the right type of person to come in there. He's done a great job in Toronto. Yes, uh, focuses on infrastructure, focuses on probably most importantly employee culture. You yes. know, and a sense of esprit de corps yeah. and pride. And he told me that was his most important thing he did in Toronto. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, we we had a cha- chance to chat at our uh, the annual meeting mm-hmm. uh, in October. And uh, the, in 2016, JTA won the system of the year in the medium-sized yeah. category. Right. And Toronto won the large category. And we had a conversation in the hallway that, you know, those awards mean so much to not just the agency for, you know, from a bragging rights standpoint. Right. But for your your culture and your organization, setting up a winning culture, and I think uh, he and I both understand that uh, the employees and a sense of pride and uh, vision and uh, a sense of purpose goes a long way to solving problems. So with his leadership, uh, New York should be doing really well. Go, yeah, going I'm excited right to see there. what's going to happen. Yes, I, I'm excited yeah. for him too. So let's go back now to Jacksonville, where you're at now. Tell yeah. us about the scope of what you do there yes. and some new things you've got coming on, which we've right. been talking about. Well, uh, at the JTA, mm-hmm. uh, extremely busy uh, uh, with the work of one, we're building in the Southeast what will be the largest bus rapid transit network in the Southeast, uh, 157 miles of bus rapid transit. We've completed two lines, the North Line and the Southeast Line. Okay. We are building and constructing the East Line, which will go out to the beaches uh, from downtown Jacksonville. Premium service uh, with uh, you know dedicated uh, bus stops. Uh, on-time performance is well over 90%. Uh, and, wow, that's great. And ridership has been strong in terms of uh, that operation. And while there has been a decline that's been seen nationally, we have not experienced the type of decline some of our peers have seen uh, largely due to the route optimization we did back in 2014. Okay. So fortunately, you know, while we may have taken a, a small dip, I think we increased by about 7%, decreased over the last year or so by about 4%. We're still kind of in the positive since uh, 2014. The uh, interesting thing is, once we did the route optimization, then we started overlaying the bus rapid transit network. Okay. Uh, we're building a regional transportation center in downtown Jacksonville. Uh, that project is going to house Greyhound. Uh, their facility will be up and running in February of this year. Uh, our regional transportation hub for the JTA will be completed in January of 2020, which will be really our main hub and transfer center uh, that will be really uh, intermodal, uh, park and ride, Uber connection, taxi nice. connection, kiss, uh, kiss, uh, kiss ride uh, facility. Uh, and on top of that will be a five-story administrative office building for JTA. Also connected to that is our Skyway. We have a two and a half mile automatic people mover that we're build, uh, that we have had for decades now, uh, almost 30 years. That will be integrated into the building. Okay. So it will actually uh, integrate into the building. However, we are studying autonomous vehicles and we have a project called the U2C, uh, U number two C okay. uh, and that project is the conversion of our Skyway to a automated people mover. Uh, I mean to a uh, autonomous yes, vehicle. Autonomous, autonomous like a vehicle, shuttle, right? uh, yes, yeah. a, a service, which we will not only uh, convert on the Skyway structure, the aerial structure, but we're building ramps that will take you down to street level with the uh, autonomous vehicles okay. and then expand into the areas that uh, our current Skyway does not reach. And so oh. very exciting project. Yeah. Uh, we opened up a test track to start testing autonomous vehicles. I saw your video. That was yeah, cool. you saw the video. Yeah. That's right. And that video is at U2C uh, at JTAFLA.com. Okay. And uh, all of the, I guess, listeners, please go there and take a look. We are actually looking for a lot of input on this project because uh, we're leveraging the existing Skyway uh, structure, uh, repurposing it. Okay. And at the same time, integrating new technology. So we're bringing something from the past and old technology and the infrastructure and marrying it with the autonomous vehicle 
infrastructure. That's neat. We'll have to get mm -hmm. the band. You know, the band U2 just did some videos on a subway system. They did. That's part of their uh, oh, promotion right, right. for their record, their new record. So since you've got the U2 going yeah, on, that's right. when you do that officially, we'll see if we have to get them down yeah, there for well, the opening. We'll make sure that they're, they're there. And, uh, you know, uh, that project uh, is something that has gotten a lot of attention from around the world. Uh, we've got, we've had uh, some... Um, is TransDev helping you do that? Uh, TransDev is going to be involved in that okay, project. Yeah. That's right. You yeah. folks are involved uh, because we want to test different manufacturers and software systems uh, to, you know, one, look at what vehicle fits uh, our uh, operating profile, and more importantly, what will be the control systems around this system. Uh, obviously, you know, we want a system that is uh, will act operate more like a fixed route operation on the major corridors but we do want to eventually get to door-to-door -door service and uh, and get to the point that we actually uh, operate this system in a uh, more urban uh, uber uh, or lyft like type fashion very good uh, so and that's what our customers are looking for they're looking for that ease of use they're looking for that uh, immediate uh, transportation conveyance and we want to provide that that's a good segue really to your new role uh, yes <laughs> at, at APTA so yeah. you're the new chairman of APTA yes. uh, elected by the membership at our meeting in October at yes. our big meeting and uh, very excited for you to get that I think you're just the right guy at just the right time oh I'm enjoying uh, it. so tell us about uh, APTA itself a little bit for our listeners mm -hmm. who maybe aren't familiar with it and then your five your five pillars or yes. your priorities for the coming year so APTA is a 1500 member organization that represents the majority of public transportation systems around the country uh, and its membership is made up and its leadership is made up of transit CEOs it's made up of transit system board members and business members. Those are the three core groups that kind of make up the APTA leadership. We have a 104 member board. Uh, I am fortunate to be the chair uh, this year uh, and uh, it's just an honor to serve in that capacity. Being identified by my peers and the industry leaders as someone at this juncture and at this time uh, to lead our, uh, our association. Uh, in terms of the uh, f in, in terms of these five priorities that uh, we're trying to focus on this year, we have our strategic plan that you know carries out over the next five years and it help, you know promotes and advocates for public transportation, helps us with legislation, helps us with it, developing standards for our industry, and creating those forms for our members to get together, share best practices, and advance our our our, um, our industry. Uh, my five priorities fit into that uh, overall strategic plan. Number one being focusing on leadership and advocacy in this industry. Over the last uh, year and a half, we've uh, been re uh, recruiting for a CEO. Uh, we've uh, recently made a decision this past December to hire Paul Scatellis as our chief executive officer. He must so, be a good guy. He's got a good first name. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. You Pauls are running the yeah. world there. But uh, the... Uh, Paul is great, uh, industry uh, uh, veteran, uh, been in this industry uh, well over 30 years, uh, served uh, as a CEO at the Pittsburgh system, at the Orlando system, the Lynx system, and most recently was uh, the National Director for Rail Transportation practice uh, with uh, WSP. Yeah, I and like so, the public and private that's combined right. backgrounds. That's right. I mean, I think yeah. that's a fantastic background and, uh, our, you know, it was unanimous, his selection. So we got that completed in December. So that was pretty much the first thing on the on the plate yeah. that needed to that be That was taken. Doran's, like, big thing the whole year. That's he was right. chairman, was and, getting that and, set and, up. And he did a great process, He I did thought. a great process yeah. and it led to a unanimous vote and support for Paul for, the, uh, again, the right person at the right time for yeah. our association and has a, the respect of all of our, 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 our members. Good. But the other part of that is advocacy. And so while we focused internally in terms of getting some things in order and hire, ultimately hiring Paul, we, are, we, had, we need to make a hard pivot. And the hard pivot is to get back to our core mission, focusing on advocacy and talking about public transportation uh, in, in preparation for reauthorization. And so, you know, getting back to uh, working on the Hill, uh, both uh, in Washington, D.C., and the hills around the country and right. at the state levels, I think there's an opportunity for partnership with the uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors, the National League of Governors, those uh, organizations that uh, their communities depend on public transportation to be successful. And so in that advocacy strategy, one, make the hard pivot, 
focus on advocacy, get back to our blocking and tackling, and moreover, what reevaluate our strategic partnerships to help advance our message. The second item is really focusing on the uh, new mobility paradigm. And mm -hmm. I think everybody's really excited yes. around this because what's happening is just as the JTA is working on autonomous vehicles, we have autonomous vehicles, we have electric vehicles, all and technology that is actually changing what our customers desire and what they're looking for in terms of transportation services. I believe, and some of it is, you know, I, I get it honestly, my experience being in San Francisco, my work that I'm doing with the Jacksonville Transportation Authority, I think when we talk public transit, we are limiting ourselves. Yes. We are mobility managers. Uh, we, we, in my case in Jacksonville, I think I've installed a great deal of sidewalks and a great deal of roads that then supported what we did with public transportation. And I think the experience that I had in San Francisco, seeing running all aspects of transportation, that our customers are looking for mobility. We talk about it in modes. We talk right. about bus, we talk about rail, we talk about paratransit. Our customers look at mobility. And I think uh, we need to make a, uh, we need to uh, begin the process of embracing this new mobility paradigm that says we're responsible for moving people in the most efficient manner uh, and be that automobile, be it biking, be it walking, be it using a bus or, 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 or rail or paratransit we should try to control and manage that space from A to Z. That's wonderful. And I think that's, that's the right vision. I, 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 it goes yeah. with, you know, and I think it's, but I, I think it, we all understand that it's how do we get there. Yes. And that's a different thought process. Uh, when I served in San Francisco in the early stages of that merger of the MTA, mm -hmm. our parking and traffic folks thought differently than our transit folks. And how do you merge those cultures together so that they're thinking about mobility from a parking, traffic, transit, holistic perspective. Yes. And culturally, we are trained and we are developed in a way that I think unfortunately silos us. Yes. And we need to kind of break those silos and think about things differently. Uh, Dorn is working on some of the work that will start APTA from a meeting standpoint, getting us to start looking at holistically having meetings that doesn't silo us mm -hmm. into bus oh, and yeah. rail. And there's still a lot of debate and discussion about yeah. that. So what I'm proposing is not being 100% accepted at this point, but a large number recognize that is our that is our future. That yes. is apt to sustainability. Absolutely. And to continue the path that we're going right now is not in line with what our customers want. Well, that's just where I was going to go. I think the way to make that shift is to change our viewpoint from looking at the production mode to the customer mode. That's right. That's what it's about. That's exactly. what our customers want. Now, they want to go to their phone, push a button, and be able to decide, how much do I pay? Where do I go in? And the what's trip the planning. most efficient right. and fastest way for me to do that? Yeah. And sometimes it's not public transportation, but it may be a combination of an automobile or a bike or a pedestrian right. walking with public transit and coupling that together. So we can't afford to own or lead one aspect of that space. We need to... Uh, to manage the entire aspect of that space. And I also would look at, too, in terms of how we, the language we use and the measurements that we use in yes. that space. Yes. So, for example, uh, you know, we have singularly focused, or you know, to a large degree, that our measurement of success is related to ridership numbers. Yeah. And unfortunately, ridership numbers, I think, do not give a good indication or not an adequate measure of our impact on our community. That's right. Uh, I think measurements that focus on outcomes, measurements that really look into the uh, the impact we have on health care, the impact we have on economic vitality, the impact that we have on uh, I mentioned healthcare outcomes, uh, the, um, uh, on educational outcomes uh, and communities, that's a much better, better measurement. Yes. And so that, you know, at some point I'll talk about my other priority, okay. which is managing big data to help yes. us kind of tell that story. The next priority is workforce development. So okay. if we're going towards a new mobility uh, management paradigm, what are the skills that our workforce need to have to start thinking that way? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, my first uh, year or so at the SFMTA, I had a parking and traffic department as well as a uh, the Muni system and the folks, 
you know, the two never met. They didn't oh, talk yeah. to each other, yeah. and the planners didn't talk to each other. The engineers didn't talk to each other in each of those groups. So we had to break down those silos, reorganize the MTA to create that culture and that environment, and then enforce a culture that had the parking and traffic folks talking to the transit folks to how to share that road, share that space in, a, in the most efficient manner for the entire gamut mm. for and making it safe for bicyclists, pedestrians, automobiles, and transit. And so that's the cultural shift and the development that we need to start looking at going into the future. In addition to that, uh, technology is so important. Mm -hmm. And how do we train our workforce to embrace technology and leverage it uh, to improve transportation outcomes for our communities? And so that is a shift from some of the workforce development that we've done in the past, which is really focused on where do we get our signal technicians? Where do we get our track workers? Where do we get mm -hmm. our operators, our mechanics going in the future? That will always still be nece necessary, but we also need to start creating uh, workforces that one, uh, embrace mobility as a service in the entire gamut, and more importantly, leverages technology. The fourth priority, leveraging big data. So uh, all of our transit systems, we collect reams and reams of data. We report to NTD, we report to our state authorities, we report locally, but uh, the measurements are we, that we use, are they the best measurements to one, uh, tell our story and, and really measure our effectiveness? Also, uh, in this day and age, how do we cross-pollinate data in a way that really shows our impact uh, in a crisp, clear uh, fashion that our elected officials can really tie the dots, mm -hmm. you know, uh, create a, a great line of thought as it relates to the impact of public transportation and what is invested in public transportation, what would be the benefits that come out on the other end. Uh, and again, using ridership or, you know, things of that nature or miles of service yes. or a number of vehicles and things of that nature. Uh, those are our measurements that we do from an internal standpoint. Right. But what are the measurements uh, that we could use big data to tell our story that uh, resonates with taxpayers, those who ride our systems, those who don't ride our systems, and the elected officials who have a great deal of influence on our, on our future. Uh, so uh, we're doing a great deal of work, you know, in terms of that priority to start developing those tools that can be used by an agency to make good business decisions, but more importantly, advocate for themselves uh, in a very crisp, graphic uh, format. And then finally, I think uh, enterprise risk management. As we embrace all of this new technology, autonomous vehicles, Wi-Fi on our vehicles, real-time passenger information, mobile ticketing, you name it, uh, there's so much technology that uh, we're deploying uh, on our systems. Uh, we increase the risk of cybersecurity yes. uh, uh, needs. Uh, we increase the risk of cybersecurity attacks, and thereby we need to increase our protections related to that. I think a lot of us understand uh, the, the risk, but uh, I've asked uh, our champions uh, on the executive committee to work with the APTA staff uh, to develop, help one, educate our industry about cybersecurity and the risks that are out there. And then more importantly, uh, what is the, I think the appropriate levels of defense that we need to start mm -hmm. deploying uh, as we start uh, opening up our systems to a larger degree uh, with, uh, you know, if we're talking about autonomous vehicles, yeah. you know, how do you control these very complex systems yes. to ensure that there's no intrusion, right. no hacking of a vehicle, yeah. things of that nature. Yeah, just so. before we sat down, I read an article about a major transit system in Canada that says they got hacked by the North Koreans yesterday. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, it's, yeah. it's happening. And, you know, I've learned mm -hmm. also, there's also the, uh, and it's unfortunate when these things happen, uh, and they do happen, there is a need to kind of share that information within this industry right. of those types of hacks and things. And that way, peers can prepare themselves and protect themselves from similar things happening. But, you know, culturally, we are, you know, it's kind of, yeah, you, wanna you don't want to share that. You want to yeah. protect your, your image. But uh, it's important for us to learn from each other. And in a lot of cases, we find that uh, the 
best vigilance are uh, internal employees. We as the JTA have had hack attempts and uh, or uh, fraud attempts that came via email and the greatest defense was not some super system that we built around it, right. uh, a virus system or something yeah. like that. It was really the employees. Yeah, teach taking, your employee not to click yeah, it, right? Teach your employee not to click it <laughs> yeah. and have that, you know, be, you know, be somewhat skeptical of something and and notices uh, perceived different differences in terms of uh, communications that may uh, lead to some type of uh, intrusion. So, well, well, I think those are awesome, uh, awesome five priorities: leadership and advocacy, new mobility paradigm, workforce of the future, leveraging big data, enterprise risk management. It's the full package oh, for our industry. So, are you optimistic talking. about the future for public mobility? Oh yes, I'm extremely uh, optimistic. I, I think this is the greatest time for us as transportation professionals to be living. Uh, it's transformational times. Uh, technologies, uh, technology is changing the way we think every day. And I think we're ahead of it. I think, uh, you know, the priorities that uh, I developed came from members, mm. you know, so as I served as vice chair, I spent my time talking to our members. Uh, and these were the five, I think, issues that they found you know, they found most perplexing or they wanted some attention to be yeah, given. It to. resonates with them. It resonated uh, with all of them. In October, when I laid these out, I had numerous volunteers who raised their hand and said, look, I really want to work on this because I, I do believe out of these five priorities, this is our future. And so uh, it's exciting for me as to serve as the chair. Um, Back in Jacksonville, everyone's excited about this opportunity for us to serve, and my leadership team, uh, we are embracing those five uh, uh, five uh, priorities back home, and it, it's, it's boding well for us. Well, uh, Nat Ford, the uh, chairman of APTA and the CEO of JTA, I think your background and experience has prepared, prepared you for this perfect opportunity to lead our industry, and it's uh, been an honor to have you with us today on the show. Well, thank you, and Paul, this was great. It gave me a chance to reflect a little bit on what we're working on, and I'm even more enthused after this interview. Very good. Again, with us today is Nat Ford, who is uh, the chairman of APTA this year and uh, a leader in our industry for over 20 years now and head of JTA, Jacksonville Transportation Authority. We didn't really even get to talk too much about your blueprint for transportation excellence. Oh, yes. But, uh, <laughs> but maybe we'll save that for another time. Well, let's yeah. do that. that. All right. Thanks so much for being with us, Nat. Thank you. You've been listening to Transit Unplugged, powered by Trapeze Group. To stay up to date, subscribe on iTunes or Google Play or join the conversation at transitunplugged.com. Thanks for listening.